Hello, Static students. Welcome to this exam review for Exam 2 in Civil Engineering 260 Statics. The first topic on the exam will be 3D equilibrium. For 3D equilibrium, we need to start off with a free body diagram. The free body diagram does need to include all external forces and or couples. Now, as you're looking at developing that free body diagram, another important thing to add there is your reactions. Now, reactions come from our reaction table that we talked about here in class. And a lot of the reactions are fairly straightforward. Um, two force members, normal forces from smooth supports, rollers, uh, a ball and socket with three forces and no moments. Really, the more complicated ones come from these different kind of bearing style reactions. And the complexity comes in that not only do we have force resistance, but we also have moment resistance. And so keep in mind that force resistance resists translation. And so for this journal bearing here, we'd have a resistance to translation both perpendicular to the axle itself and um, additionally then resistance to rotation. And that's going to be around these axes, which are in the same direction as the two forces, right? So um, uh, the support couples resist twisting, the support forces resist translation. And once again, the, the basic case here for a journal bearing is that we have a pair of each both perpendicular to the axle. And you know that any kind of bearing will have minimum of these four, and then we'll add in a couple of the other directions just depending on uh, the type of system. So we have um, square shaft adds in a resistance to rotation about the axle. A thrust bearing adds in a resistance to translation of the axle. Now thrust bearing, smooth pin, single smooth pin, and also a hinge all act the same way. Okay, the exact same terms, all of them with this additional force um, along the pin or axle itself in addition to the pair of forces perpendicular and the pair of moments, the pair of couples perpendicular. And then the last kind of support there we had was the um, fixed support. Fixed support having an opportunity for three forces in all three directions and three resistant couples all three directions. Now, another nuance that we talked about on these topics is that these re resistant couples, these M's as labeled in this diagram here, um, are always available, but sometimes they're not engaged. And they're typically not engaged if we have more than... Um, one support. And so going back to this page in our notes, support forces engage before support couples. The basic idea here is if we have only one support, um, like in this case right here, this journal bearing at A, that would likely engage those couples. Whereas over here on this other diagram, we have two different supports, one a journal bearing, one a thrust bearing. And therefore, these couples that are perpendicular here to Y, so in the X and the Z, will not engage because the support forces in the opposing um, um, bearing will engage first. Now, then the next step is getting into actually solving the problems. Now, as you think about solving these problems, we have our six equations, some of the force x, y, z, some of the moments x, y, z. As you take some of the moments, probably the easiest way to do this is sum all moments about one single point. So you end up with kind of multiple determinants from each r cross f moment, and then um, gather all of your I terms, your J terms, and your K terms into independent equations. I hat, J hat, K hat equals zero. And that gives you your uh, moment equations. Fundamentally, about some of the moment in the X is your I hat equation. Some of the moment in the Y is your J hat. Some of the moment in the Z is your K hat. All right, so after we covered 3D equilibrium, we got back into two-dimensional problems, and we talked about fixity and statical determinacy. And we had three rules for determining if problems were solvable in statics. These three rules are if there are three support force components, that's a good thing. We want three, because then we have three equations, some of the force X, some of the force Y, some of the moment. Um, we also do not want um, parallel support forces. If they are parallel, then we can have translation perpendicular to those supports. And then the third one here is that we want the lines of action to intersect at one or more points. Um, many problems have one point. Some of them have more than one. And so uh, we know that with two or more intersection points, the problem is solvable. So if all three of those are true for a rigid body, noting that this is the free body diagram of that rigid body without any applied loads, right? These are only reactions. Um, then we know that that system, no matter what the external loads are is solvable. All right, moving on and now into trusses. 
the basics of trusses is that we assume that all trusses are made of two force members. Being two force members, they're always going to be either in pure tension or pure compression. Often we assume members are in tension until we solve, we get negative numbers, we know that they're going to be in compression. You also can go through in advance and kind of analyze um, tension versus compression. Um, before you start writing your equations and then basically your equations once again still validate or disprove your hypothesis of the direction of those forces. Uh, there's two ways that we had to solve um, trusses. I'll come back to the points two and three. We'll jump here to three and four. Uh, we have method of joints. Method of joints is essentially a series of concurrent force free body diagrams. Um, two forces at each joint. And if you want to solve for all of those unknowns, then you need at least one known at that joint as well. Uh, we use angles to find components, sines and cosines to find our components. Um, and we may need to solve for external forces first, or those, those external reaction supports. Uh, just depends, depends on if we have one of these joints that has a single um, known value, one or more known values and two or fewer unknown to work our way around. Uh, noting we cannot use moment equations in our concurrent force free body diagrams. So in our joint free body diagrams, we're stuck with just forces because all forces go through one single point. And we basically work through joint by joint by joint. The other way that we can solve um, for um, members of a typically a fewer number of members in a truss is using the method of sections. And so we want to cut through or close to the member or members we want to solve, um, often limiting that at three members and not more. And then we want to solve only for the supports that are on the section cut free body diagram that we create. Keeping in mind, if you don't cut through a member, it doesn't bleed. Therefore, you don't need to solve for that unknown. And then the last point there is just make sure you um, know that the method of sections and joints can be used in sequence. Okay, you can use one and then the other. Uh, jumping back into a few other topics here, let's take a look here at zero force members. So zero force members, there's two different cases. Uh, the first case is where two members meet at an unloaded joint. Based on a free body diagram, you have just these two um, it actually doesn't matter if they're collinear or non-collinear, but if there's no other forces in there, um, both are going to be zero force values. And then the second case is if you have three forces, whether those forces come from members, um, external, which would include both applied and also reaction forces, if, they, if those meet at a joint and two of them share the same line of action, okay, that means that they're collinear, then the non-concurrent, or excuse me, this needs to be changed to non-collinear member is a zero force member. So just noting the highlight here that this term concurrent should be collinear Basically, it's that third wheel rule. The third one is a zero force member. Uh, both cases need to be justified at just one end of the beam. Um, and note that also finding zero force members is iterative. And when you're done, make sure to redraw your whole truss and that you still have triangles and that all those given loads are still supported by the triangles. So that wraps up our overview of trusses. Next, we got, up, we got into frames and machines. Now, noting that frames and machines are still multi-body problems, multiple free body diagrams. The main difference that we're picking up here is that in trusses, everything was a two force member. In frames and machines, we now have multi-force members as well as two force members. And so our equations, instead of being about joints, are now going to be about bodies. Okay, so the advantage there is we pick up the third equation again, we can also have our sum of moment equation. Um, now, if you still have concurrent forces on a single body, that will limit you to two forces, the force in the X, the force in the Y, both equal to zero. And then a two force body really only has one equation. That's just really telling you that the force on one end is equal to the force on the other end, and those are in opposite directions. One of the key things with frames and machines is to make sure that you have all of your internal forces equal and opposite. This supports Newton's third law, where every action has an equal opposite reaction. So we're just looking at these adjoining body forces are equal and opposite. If you have rigid systems, you can solve for the supports first. If you have non-rigid systems, you often break it up into separate free body diagrams first. Uh, make sure not to cut frames and machines, these multi-body systems, um, and essentially try to use method of joints or method of sections, it will not work. You're exposing more unknown forces, which we learned about uh, in chapter seven, those internal shear forces and internal bending moments. So hopefully you've seen that. Um, 
We'll talk about it later in this video, but neither of those will work. Make sure you do the free body diagrams of the entire bodies, um, uncut bodies, just separate those bodies apart. Next, we got into centroids. And in centroids, we looked at both two-dimensional, three-dimensional um, centroids um, related to area, centroids related to mass, centroids related to weight. And in the various um, frameworks, you essentially have the same overall equation. And you just need the area in the top here to cancel with the area in the bottom. So if you're finding, if you're using weights, you need a first moment of the weight in the top, the weight times the x tilde of each body summed all up, and then divide that by the total weight. And we set up some pretty organized charts, or excuse me, tables to do this um, as we work our way from one body to the next. Uh, important things here is keep in mind that, that if you have an, an axis distance, so a distance from our absolute axes back to the centroid of a body, which is negative, make sure to list that as a negative x tilde, y tilde, or z tilde value. And then if you have any cutouts in your shape, make sure that you list those as negative areas, volumes, weights, masses, whatever unit you're using in your computations. So a natural next step from centroids is jumping back to section 4.9 and thinking about distributed loads. And so distributed loads are looking at if we have a force that is distributed over a length. Now in this um, framework here, we only looked at two dimensional distributed loads. We realize they could be also distributed um, over a third dimension, basically over an area as well. But we can replace a distributed load with externally equivalent point loads, where the magnitude is the area under the load and the location is through the centroid of the distributed load. After this equivalent point load free body diagram has been created, then we're back to solving with our standard some force x, some force y, some moment on a three dimensional body. Um, next, after distributed loads, we got into chapter 7. And chapter 7 was looking at the internal forces. And once we cut inside a multi-force body, we expose an axial force, we expose a shear force, and we expose a bending moment. This is covered in sections 7.1 through 7.3, although we didn't really dig too deeply into 7.2, which is writing these equations, uh, basically location variable equations. But you're welcome to take a look at that if you'd like to. So we have positive sign conventions for section 7.1 in order to draw our shear and moment diagrams and basically find the same signs that we would from our shear and moment diagrams. That is that the axial force, which is labeled either A or N, um, is going to be positive in tension, negative in compression. Um, then the shear force is going to be positive if that force alone would try to cause clockwise, which is opposite right-hand rule uh, rotation. And then the, the bending moment at the cut face would be um, smiling. So let's take a look at how those assumed positive shear moment and axial forces manifest themselves. And so if we have tension as positive, I'm going to list this as my tension force, my axial force A. Now the shear causing opposite the right hand rule rotation means downward here on this right cut face, so this would be V, and then upwards here on the left cut face, and then the moments would curl up over the top, causing this beam to basically concave downward, um, and so that's smiling, and so that would be, um, they're curled around, the arrow's pointing upward on both ends, and so these would all, so these are all assumed positive values of the shear, axial, and moment. If you get a negative value, it doesn't mean that you are wrong in your computations. It simply says that by these sign conventions, we know that um, we have the force or the moment in the opposite direction. Back over to our review sheet. So when we have a direct solve, we do need the supports at least that are on the half of the body on the section that we're solving. We draw these positive forces and make sure if you draw a distributed load, just compute a new resultant R for the portion remaining. So you can think that your blue saw that you're cutting through this uh, multi-force body with, you want to cut through both the distributed load and also the beam itself, and then only leave the portion remaining of that distributed load. And we did a couple problems related to that. But when you're solving for your axial shear and moment, make sure you're just using there your standard sign conventions. Okay, so draw a free body diagram with our assumed positive shear, axial, and moment 
terms, and then solve any free body diagram. It doesn't matter which free body diagram we're talking about in this class using standard sign conventions. The last topic we covered were shear and moment diagrams. Now, shear and moment diagrams enable us to solve for all the shear and moment values across the entire length of a beam, as opposed to those just at single points. These shear and moment diagrams are independent of axial force. Okay, so the axial force does not play into the shear and also does not play into the moment. And the loading, the shear, and the moment are related by integrals. If we take an integral of our loading, we end up with our shear. If we take an integral of our moment, or excuse me, integral of our shear, we end up with our moment. And so with these integral relationships, we also have basically they manifest themselves as these kind of jumps and slopes. And so here's a table summarizing those jumps and slopes. If you have an upwards force, it's an upward shear force jump. If you have a downward force, it's a downward shear force jump. Okay, if you have a distributed load in your um, the loading, we're going to have a positive shear slope. The value of the shear slope is, excuse me, the value of the load is the shear slope. And then, of course, negative to the negative. And down here for moments, um, the jumps caused by by couples. Now these are concentrated couples at one specific location. So these are not R cross F couples or R cross F moments. These are the couples that are drawn with rotational arrows. If it is positive from the right hand rule, it is a downward moment jump. And you can use either of these two rules, opposite the right hand rule, or you draw your couple arrows always on the left hand side of their point of application and the arrow will point in the jump direction. And then we also have this relationship for the slopes that the value of the shear is the slope of the moment. So positive slope, or excuse me, positive value of shear gives me a positive moment slope. I mentioned there is kind of this alternate technique in cutting at an unknown distance x and deriving the shear and moment. It's essentially using knowledge from 7.1 and these same kind of shear moment diagrams with assumed positive values. And instead of solving at one specific point we're going to solve for regions of loading and so every beam basically between loads would have a different equation for its shear and moment and we could drive those and then in the example that we did on Wednesday in class I also showed you how to write equations for the loading the shear and the moment and the key point here is really to not make sure you don't forget the starting values these integration constants um, as you're writing your subsequent equations moving across the beam essentially one one equation starts where the last one left off and so you need to bring in the influence of a previous loading section on the next loading section and that's where these integration constants come in thanks for your attention hope this review helped and i wish you all the best of luck